Alam naming nag-aalala ka. Kaya ginagawa namin ang lahat ng aming makakaya. Para safe ka dito sa ospital. Ang bawat pumapasok, kinukuha ang temperature at mga detalye para sa contact tracing. Sinisiguro din na may tamang social distancing ang mga pasyente. Ang ospital at medical staff ay nakasuot ng protective equipment. Tuloy-tuloy ang disinfection sa lahat ng areas ng ospital. Huwalay ang lugar sa mga regular na check-up o procedure. Siguro ang mga equipment at kwarto ay sterilized at malinis. Kaya huwag kang mag-alala, safe at alaga ka dito. Safe at alaga kayo dito. Dito sa La Constellation University General Hospital, Nakahanda na kami magbigay serbisyo itong bagong panahon para sa iyo at sa pamilya mo.
Um, good morning. Uh, once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, dear academic dignitaries and luminaries from all parts of the world. May we request the microphones to be turned off and the video to be turned on so we can start with our opening pro ceremony. May we request everybody to show respect and participate during the audio-visual presentations of the invocation to be followed by the national anthems of the Republic of the Philippines and India. Director Rodriguez, please. Thank you. Welcome to our second day of Intellectual Odyssey. Uh, yesterday was a precious moment to behold as a full-packed plenary uh, listened to the world-renowned speakers. Uh, it, will, it is amazing to know that our live stream audience reached a consistent 2,000 viewers yesterday. That was a wonderful feat, okay? So uh, our parallel sessions were also full packed. So there was even a time that rooms had to be closed 
And uh, so today, we hope to uh, have the equal number of uh, viewers. And I could see on the screen a lot of viewers coming from uh, different parts of the Philippines. We have Giselle Baluso. Good morning. Watching from Balagtas, Bulacan. Saldivar Dawa. Good morning. Watching from Riyadh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have Ivy, good morning. Top Vids, good morning from Baliwag, Bulacan. Philo de Jesus of uh, LCUP Malolos. Michael Cabrera, good morning. How are you there in San Pedro, Laguna? Roxanne Aimim Castro, good morning as well. You're watching from San Jose del Monte City. And we also have the same um, location for or Annalyn Sia. Erlinda Navarro, watching from San, del, San Jose del Monte. Alexander Gochanko, good morning. Uh, from Cabanatuan City, Nueva Ecija. Uh, shouting out to uh, his classmates in the IT. Wendy Anraga, good morning, everyone. Uh, from Leyte. Uh, and then we have uh, Baby Jane Dignos. Ruth Calop, good morning. Um, uh, watching from Taguig City. And we also have um, Marian Valentino watching from the city of Malolos, uh, our DID student. And Redino Ruan Ancheta, good morning, watching from Pasig City. So we have a lot of uh, viewers from all parts of um, uh, the, the world, the Philippines. Okay, so... Um, it was truly delightful to hear innovative ideas and amazing knowledge fresh from the intellectuals themselves. We've heard about our similarities as people of the world and differences as individuals diversified by culture and personalities in coping with the global pandemic. That was yesterday. Today will be hopefully equal, if not more productive, informative and enjoyable as we explore the influx of great perspectives from great minds we are hearing feedbacks from presenters yesterday and they were so enthusiastic and were asking for the next international conference to be uh, organized by lcup and jera so good morning mary car fabian watching from bulacan joan carabello from San Jose del Monte, Maylin Sampang from Pasig City, uh, Shobi Chua from uh, San Jose del Monte City, and uh, we also have a watcher from Abalakat Pampanga, Michael Gerald Lissing. Hello, good morning, everyone. I know it's kind of rainy right now, but you know, no rain can stop us, okay? Um, a pleasant day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yours truly is Dr. Janet Valdez of La Consolation University, Philippines, the mistress of ceremonies during this conference. Our second day plenary session is fortunately lined up with seven great guest speakers from the Kingdom of Bahrain, India, Ghana, and the host country, our very own, the Philippines. It is a pleasant privilege to introduce the guest speakers one by one before their talk. Let me keep you waiting. Let me not keep you waiting by introducing to you our first guest speaker. I'm really very excited today because of the feedback we were getting from you yesterday. Wonderful day, a great audience, great uh presenters um everything uh came smoothly and we hope to have the same today so to introduce the first guest speaker uh he um he is mr Eugene rowan escu a clinician and academician who strives to attain continuous professional development to better serve his clientele both patients and future professional nurses. His clinical specialization is nephrology nursing, where he spent majority of his bedside nursing experience in rendering nursing care of patients undergoing dialysis treatment. 
hemodialysis and peritoneal in the nephrology service of V. Luna General Hospital and in Quezon City, Philippines. I should know how caring the uh, dialysis and nurses are. So he earned his Bachelor of Science in Nursing at the Far Eastern University, Manila, where he was awarded as one of the outstanding senior students for his academic excellence and leadership contributions in student organizations such as the Institute of Nursing Student Council and Red Cross Youth Council. He obtained his Master of Arts in Nursing, major in clinical nursing at Trinity University of Asia, and is currently taking up his doctor in nursing management degree from the same university. At present, he is a faculty member of the Institute of Nar Nursing at Far Eastern University, Manila, handling subjects such as theoretical foundations of nursing, nursing pharmacology, nursing informatics, and medical surgical nursing, to name a few. He had published a textbook on nursing informatics together with Professor Josie K Q Udan and is currently having a joint project with Professor Udan for more textbook publications. His notable achievements were being one of the youngest awardees of the Civilian Employee of the Year clinical category for his outstanding performance in clinical care during his bedside work at V. Luna General Hospital under the Armed Forces of the Philippines Medical Center, also known as AFP Health Service Command. He was also awarded with the Emerald Award by the Philippine Army Nursing Service for his commendable contribution in health service capability enhancement of the said organization. Ladies and gentlemen, our researchers, academicians, here's Mr. Eugene Rowan S. Ku. Sir. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. So let me start by uh, presenting this, uh, this slide. So I hope everyone can see my slides now. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our participants. So for this first topic, I'm going to introduce the difficulties in the remote learning of Philippine University students during COVID-19. So I have here some word cloud, which is the result of the study uh, conducted by Rotas and, uh, and Kahapai. So we have here poor peer communication, poor learning environment, vague learning contents, overloaded lesson activities, and unstable internet connectivity. Okay. Now, if we will look at the, the word cloud closely, the commonality here is that we must focus on uh, engagement as a resolution. So uh, by engagement, we mean here is we need to immerse, involve, and interact with the students, specifically now that we have online learning. And uh, most of our students are really missing that face-to-face -face interaction. Okay. So of course, we uh, despite the online learning, we can still engage our students. Okay, but the question is how, and uh, the another question is that uh, are we ready to learn with these educational technology tools? So right now, my presentation will focus on the educational technology applications, specifically in nursing, since this is a skills-based and it is very challenging to deliver our learning objectives. So my name is Nyujin Ku, and I'm a faculty of the Institute of Nursing from Forrester University, Manila, Philippines. So to start with, let me give you my objectives, or rather, the question would be, what would be your objectives for your students? So I have categorized here collaboration, gamification, and behavioral and decision-making. Okay? For the uh, for the availability of the time, I'm just going to give you a bird's eye view of what this application would be and what would be my personal view on how to use these uh, educational technology tools. Okay, So, of course, we have our primary uh, tool, which is the whiteboard before when 
we were having the face to face uh face to face contact with our students so we are able to express ourselves we are able to give our ideas effectively using the whiteboard but with the online learning it has became one of the struggles both on the students and the faculty to express their ideas so why not have a collaborative uh, application such as the whiteboard chat the mirror board jamboard ed puzzle and of course the flip grid which i'm going to uh, explain later on okay then we could also have uh, games or what we call the gamification so that we could uh, let the students have more retention towards the ideas and the concepts that we are teaching such as kahoot game lab blended play edu candy and super teacher tools uh, among the educational technology applications and lastly would be the behavioral and decision making wherein we want to also train our students to become the ideal professionals that they uh, that they need to be so yeah uh, since online learning is very difficult to control that a an edtech application that i have discovered would be classcraft to uh, to help in the uh, giving the students a positive attitude Okay, so let's start first with collaboration. As I've mentioned, this is all about the whiteboard application. So when we talk about the whiteboard application, these applications can help educators collaborate with students in order to understand a concept that needs either a workshop or a write shop, such as in our case, it would be the nursing process, specifically for beginning nursing students, wherein they're really struggling to, uh, to determine which is which, uh, which data should they place onto this uh onto this uh category okay or the nursing assessment phase so i have compiled here at least three whiteboard applications so let me start first by discussing what is whiteboard chat followed by what is mirror board and what is jam board okay so let's talk about whiteboard that chat so if you are that type of uh faculty who is really hands-on and you would really love to see the out of your students Okay, whiteboard that chat is what I can recommend uh, to you because the it, it has a shareable link that your students can use and they don't need to register or sign up. You ju they just need to uh, click on the link and then your whiteboard or the whiteboard that you are uh, discussing synchronously would all would also be seen on their end. And of course, if you see here, you have a grid view. So if you click on grid view, you are able to see what they are working on. For example, you want to uh, you want to determine their uh, their reflection or their take or their reaction on a certain concept. So you could just uh, make the initiative by typing first the uh, the leading question, and then the rest will follow. So as you can see, there are a lot of customizations that you can use for whiteboard that chat. All right. So next would be the mirror board. So uh, mirror board is also one of my favorites. So I'm, what I'm going to show you is the actual work that we've done okay, uh, during uh, this uh, mid-year term. So I have here the nursing care plan that we are uh, supposedly discussing. And of course, without this edtech application for me on my own take, uh, it would be very difficult to let the students understand what is going on with uh, with the nursing care plan. Okay, so uh, what is good about this mirror board is it is also easy to share and it has this customization or uh, you can use sticky notes. It has templates in it. So if you're, let's say you're discussing, let's say a mind map or a concept map, it would be very easy if you're going to use this mirror board because of their templates here and as you can see the the colors are very catchy the students can move around with the sticky notes so you could place there so for example here in my frame here that as you can see i have placed here distractors wherein the students will be able to analyze which uh, which uh, sticky notes should be placed on the category or the nursing phase that I have given here. So it is with this, this is a sample output and uh, the students were able to understand what uh, we are trying to prove or what are the concepts and principles behind the nursing care plan. Okay, so if 
for example, you have a Google account. So most of us have a Google account, even the students have. So for example, you don't want to go outside of the Google platform. Then what I recommend for you to use is the Jamboard. The Jamboard is also synonymous to your Miro board, wherein you could also play sticky notes. But of course, the sharing here would be from one Google account to another Google account. So if your students do not have a Google account, then they cannot join your synchronous class using this uh, online application. Okay, so let me summarize by giving my personal view on whiteboard.chat, Miro board, and Jamboard. So with whiteboard.chat, specifically if you do not have this strong internet connection, which all of us is are currently experiencing, especially with the bad weather nowadays, okay, so you can use whiteboard.chat because it is low in bandwidth and data consumption. So it is beneficial to both the students and the faculty. And best of all, you, you will not waste time by allowing pre-registration because there is no registration needed here. You could also build games and build several templates using the whiteboard that chat. Okay. Now for Miro board, the, the, the main advantage here is the templates that they are uh, giving. It is very easy to use. It is user, uh, it has this user friendliness. And of course, for example, you want to go directly to Miro to Miro board, it has this video conferencing uh, feature wherein you do not need to use Zoom, or you do not need to use Google Meet or any video conferencing application. It's all here in Miro board. It also offers premium subscription also for premium services. And lastly, for Jamboard, which is uh, very accessible if you have a Google account and it is shareable between the Google accounts and it is best for collaborations for one output, okay? So that is my take on the different whiteboard applications. Now, what if we are skills-based? And for example, right now, the students do not have a hospital uh, uh, exposure because of the COVID-19. How are we going to build our scenarios? Well, one of my uh, applications that I can recommend would be Edpuzzle. You can use here the scenario builder to engage your students. And this time, you can reinforce accountability because Every step of the way in your Ed puzzle, that's why it is called an Ed puzzle. Every piece of the puzzle has a question for your students to solve. And whatever decision that they make, they will have their accountability. So, also with uh, Ed puzzle, what I like about this is that it gives you, it saves you time to integrate YouTube videos and other crash courses to the Ed puzzle. All you have to do is just to customize the content based on the learning objectives that you have set for your students, okay? So I'll, for example, here, unfortunately, I cannot do the demonstration right now. When, uh, when I've introduced the chain of infection, you see the dots here, okay? The dots here represent the pause in the video. So every time the video is paused, there would be a question that will be flashed for the students to answer. So the students will not be able to move on with the video unless they have submitted their answer here on the Ed puzzle. Okay. So next one is Flipgrid. So we are all familiar or maybe familiar with Facebook, with the social media such as TikTok. Okay. The hybrid in educational technology is what we call Flipgrid. Flipgrid is a simple, free, and accessible video discussion experience for learners, families, and even your faculties. So you can now start a discussion and engage with your students. So Flipgrid is just like Facebook wherein you will post something and then you will expect your students to comment on it, okay? So this is actually a video discussion board that uh, it can be synchronous or it can be asynchronous here, okay? So like, uh, like I did, so if we are going to ask me, okay? So this is a sample of my flip grid that I've used during the past uh, semester here. So you would just have either to share the QR code or the uh, manual code to your students so that they can uh, interact with you. Okay, so for example here, uh, this is actually the replacement for the learning feedback diary, but this is more on the virtual sign. So for example here, I have created a clinical reflection wherein the students will be able to share their views instead of typing. Of course, they hate doing a lot of typing jobs. So why not involve them into an educational platform that is 
that has a theme of uh, using social media. Okay, so you describe, for example, here you describe the the virtual clinical experiences or on the simulations, and uh, of course, surprisingly, the students are very, uh, very interactive towards this. No, unfortunately, with the uh, data privacy issues, I cannot show you the outputs of my students, but really, you must try it so that uh, you will be able to appreciate Flipgrid. Okay, so next would be gamification. Of course, you cannot expect uh, the generation of students right now, which has their uh, short, uh, short attention span, to really listen to you for very long hours of lecture discussion. Also, it would be very tiring on your part. So why not introduce them into a game or uh, to, to improve their, uh, their memory retention, okay? So instead of doing, let's say, we have recitations during face-to-face, -face, why not use gamification? So here are some reasons why we should gamify. Games played uh, converts into basic needs such as it promotes sense of autonomy, value, competence, and of course, it uh, introduces the social aspects which is lacking now when we have our online learning so games encourage ongoing and uh, continuous engagements it helps retain the users by encouraging them to keep playing as they play as they get hooked to your game they uh they want to earn more points more rewards or simply discover more information which is our learning objective okay so we cannot do this by simply just going live and then doing lecture discussions so we must also integrate here our uh, innovations or our uh, teaching strategies using gamification so it, it gives the learners control and then they feel that they are in charge of their learning journey while meeting their learning objective so gamification works because it triggers real powerful human emotions such as happiness intrigue excitement and accomplishment so all around the world companies institutions and household brands are using gamification with marvelous results so there are a lot of gamification tools that you can use but i have only recommended here based on user friendliness and of course more importantly more the economical side which is it has a free okay it has a freemium okay or you can use it for free so of course one of the popular games uh use okay game applications that you that we often use is Kahoot. But of course, uh, uh, as time passed by, your students might get, uh, might get used to Kahoot. So you need to innovate further. So what I recommend would be for you to use blended play if you want to engage a team play among your students. Gamey Lab, wherein you want to introduce a, scen a scenario or individual uh, team play here, specifically for skills-based courses, such as, for example, if you want to introduce a particular skill, Okay, such as in nursing. And of course, Educandy, if you want, or if you're so, or the subject that you are teaching is mostly on definitions, more on uh, concept retaining games, I suggest you use Educandy, wherein you can, uh, wherein you can play uh, games such as crossword puzzle, uh, word hunt, etc. Okay, so I guess uh, some of us are already familiar with Kahoot because of its user friendliness. You just share your game code and then the students will be able to join. So a game-based uh, learning platform uh, that is being uh, used widely in schools and other educational institutions. So with the free, uh, free account, you can just use Kahoot using multiple choice and uh, true or false questions. But if you want to uh, get your game a bit further, you need to subscribe to their premium account. Okay, the next one is the, the blended play. So it has, uh, the advantage here is that it has already several templates that you can just place your, uh, place your questions. You can, you can just copy and paste and put it into the application and then the application will do the rest. Okay, so this is a very easy online gaming portal where users can review the content in any subject through games displayed on the screen. Okay, so if you have time, you can just go on and uh, log into blendedplay.com. Okay, so I will not be able to show the, uh, the uh, demonstration because of the lack of time but uh, as you can see here we have mountain climbers we're in the students the aim of the game is to go on top of the mountain by answering the questions that you have made 
for the students. So it only it not only engages, of course, teamwork, but it also encourages now the students to read in advance so that they can per they can participate actively on the game. Okay. Now, Educandy, as I've mentioned, it is a word type of game wherein you can practice concepts, vocabulary, and answer basic questions about the content that you want to introduce to your students. Okay. So this is a sample of the Educandy here. So it can be multiple choice. It can be word hunt. So the ideas here are, li are uh, limitless. And based on their templates, you can use a wide variety of templates that are free and easy to use. It also has a direction wherein you could, uh, you could explore so that it would make your presentation more effective. Okay, Gamey Love is a bit more technical, but if you get used to it, it has wonderful uh, applications wherein if your students is having problems with internet connectivity and you cannot go sync with them, then Gamey Lab might be the answer because it has asynchronous challenges that, uh, that you can use so that your students can also play the game asynchronously or not in real time. Okay, so it also has a template on it. Okay. Now, one of my favorites now is the class craft, wherein you could also introduce you know, the proper attitude, and it has uh, games such as uh, attaining quest, and then where in each of the quests, you can introduce a concept that they need to master. For example, you want to uh, ask them to read a book, you, so you can just place in a task there, and then you could put review questions there, and then they will be able to... Uh, if they meet the task, they will they would be rewarded in the game automatically. Okay, so you just need to program it, and of course you could use the insights from measurable data to support at risk students. So Classcraft would also uh, determine which students are at risk and is in need of your support. Okay, so as you can see, this is a sample wherein uh, this is actually face to face before, but. Uh, Classcraft can be used either in face-to-face -face or specifically now uh, in online learning, wherein you orient the students uh, how the game would be by just showing them the orientation video made by Classcraft. And then the rest, of course, would be easy as following the template. Okay. Now, why are we promoting this? It is because of the relationship of students with technology. Okay? With our uh, generation of students, 94% of students use their smartphones every hour. So we must take advantage of this to make learning more fun and attain our learning objectives more efficiently. Okay, so here are some of my thoughts in using EdTech tools, such as you need to define first what will be your concept, and then you need to have a trial over what application would you like to use, which is the production. And then you need to test the game by doing student previews and testing. Okay, lastly, if you have made the game, you don't, do not forget to get the student feedback if they find this tool effective or not. If it is effective, then you need to enhance. If it is not effective, then look for another educational technology tool that is applicable in teaching your concept or your subject. Okay? And of course, per, uh, per application, it has a monitoring. So you could monitor the progress even if it is a game. So this is one of the wonderful things in educational technology tools. All right? And of course, some thoughts would be the visual effects versus the experiential effects. The, the, experience, uh, uh, the experiential effects, we already have that because we have been teaching this concept for quite some time, but now we need to enhance it with the visual effect. So we must visualize first the technical side, and then we must combine what are the things that we need to impart to our students to be more effective. So you... For any more questions, you could reach me through email, through Facebook, or through my LinkedIn accounts as shown, uh, as shown here. Okay. So lastly, I would like to impart this quotation by uh, George Kuros. Technology will never replace great teachers, but in the hands of great teachers, it would be transformational. All right. And in order to keep up with the future of technology, we must all be willing to change our old mindset into an open one towards innovation. So with this, thank you very much for your time and have a great day.
Thank you, Mr. Ku. Uh, that was definitely enriching. We agree with you. Student engagement through collaborative learning is one approach of hybrid learning of the future. So we teachers my age should equip ourselves with, you know, gamifying uh, applications and you know we really have to keep up with you young people young teachers okay but definitely no um uh, technology will not be able to replace teachers thank you so much uh, mr ku so for our next speaker we have um from the kingdom of Bahrain, Kingdom of Bahrain, Mrs. Monica Verma Saha. Do we have uh, Mrs. Monica Saha in the... Uh, uh, okay, hello, good morning, ma'am. How are you? Good morning, good morning. How are you? Uh, we're fine. We're definitely fine and uh, happy to see you. Mrs. Monica Verma Saha has approximately 13 years of experience in the field of education. Her work ranged from school teaching to teacher educator. She has worked in India, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and now Kingdom of Bahrain. She is currently working as a coordinator in the New Horizons School in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Let us hear from our second guest speaker, Mrs. Monica Verma Saha. Ms. Mrs. Saha? Thank you so much. Can I uh, share my PPT also? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, okay, fine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, I assume that uh, obviously uh, we have so many teacher educators and uh, the future teachers who are looking over to us from Philippines and India and, of course, across the world. And uh, what I feel is that uh, because of the COVID-19, you know, suddenly uh, the uh, the, the teachers were, you know, within a day, within a second, they were just told that, uh, yes, you have to just, uh, you know, start teaching and uh, through online basis, which was very, very difficult for many of the teachers. And I assume that, yes, uh, this, uh, I think everybody's going to agree to it. Um, as we also had so much of challenges, um, I think many of us, uh, many of our teachers who have been teaching for so many years, but through face-to-face -face teaching, wouldn't um, have, uh, you know, they had actually felt so much of problems. But now, obviously, after one year of training, um, the teachers have uh, really worked into it. They have learned how to make PPTs. They have learned how to do, uh, as, as told just by the earlier guest speaker, about the gamifications or, uh, you know, different things altogether, the new concepts uh, which, uh, were, which are being taught by the teachers nowadays. Now, if I share my... Uh, uh, wait, I can just share my. Uh, excuse me, I really I need to share my uh, PPT. How can I share my PPT over here? Uh, yes, you may, uh, Mrs. Uh, Saba. Uh, I cannot see the PPT actually from my uh, window. Hmm? Wait, okay. Mm, screen share was cancelled. Wait. Uh, Uh, excuse me, can I uh, can I share my PPT? How can I share my PPT? Or can I send it to you?
I think everybody can see it. Can everybody see it? Not right now. Earlier it was projected. Earlier it was projected. Yeah, it was projected. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I would just uh, show it. Okay. Okay. Just give me a moment. Okay. So what is the perspective approach towards the school education by the future teachers? Uh, well, we already know that we are going through the 21st century teaching learning skills and what are the four c's which are very very important which we look towards the students right now what we want as teachers what do we want from the students well first of all what do we want is collaboration then communication creativity and critical thinking collaboration as because you know that they are sitting at home right and it's very difficult for them right now to collaborate but how do they collaborate as we use zoom and other you know uh the google classrooms or microsoft teams i uh, you know it depends on school to school where you will be going and teaching which platform are they using right now as in my school if i tell you we use Zoom and in Zoom, the best part is that you can have breakout rooms and with the breakout rooms, what happens is I just stop sharing it for a moment. Yes. So what happens in the breakout room is that you can actually either manually or automatically send the students for their own discussion, okay? And that can be used even in a jigsaw uh, model right now, which is a very much uh, required 21st century skill teaching learning and inst instruction strategy. And what happens is that in that breakout room, the students can discuss among each other and you can give a timing. It depends on you how much time you want to give as teachers. And then after this, once the breakout room is done and when the discussion is done uh, according to your allotted time, then they can again come to the main room and then they can discuss whatever they have discussed in the small groups. It is easy for the teachers to maintain or to, you know, collaborate with them in smaller groups. As a teacher, you can because you are you're the one who will be holding up or you will be taking care of the Zoom session. So you can go to each and every breakout room and check what are they discussing. And you would get to know that, yes, wherever they have, uh, you know, any difficulty in any uh, discussion, they, you can collaborate as a teacher. It's your work, only your work to be facilitator. So it's very easy and it's very good. Next one, if I just tell you. Why do we need the 21st century skills? Obviously, for uh, collaboration and leadership, critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, social responsibility, communication. What is more important right now is digital literacy. Uh, the, uh, and, uh, the guest speaker who just went before me was talking a, a lot about uh, digital literacy and which is very much prevalent right now because everybody from the class KG 
still higher ups, everybody has, you know, uh, the mobile phones in their hands. So digital literacy is very much important. And as teachers, we need to have digital literacy a little more than them because we need to teach them and everything is available on Google. But yes, obviously the teachers cannot be taken up like you know even though everything is taken up by internet but the teachers requirement is very much there to collaborate to communicate to give them a, a, a sense of critical thinking that's very much important what i have made over here is a bit of uh, uh, for the teachers what we are using over here is like what sir was talking about jam board okay now i will just tell you how the jam board obviously he was just talking about the jam board when i have also made a jam board See over here in this jam board just give me a moment yes now as an english teacher what you can do is that um, it's just, just um, um, I'm giving you an example um, for a Hindi teacher or for a maths teacher or for anybody. Uh, basically, I've just given you an example over here. Uh, when you say a comprehension, what you can do is that over here, I've given you a background. A the, the kids have been given a background, right? As for English, how do you write down? So you can use pen over here and then they can start writing. Like supposedly they can write down with pen. Okay. And uh, if you say, no, 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 the handwriting is not good. So what you can do is that they can use the erasers also. But yes, what is important over here is sharing. You can share the link with the students. And then you that is very much important that all the students should have a Gmail account. Right. And over here, when you copy the link and over here, when you say the get when you see here, get link. It has to be that anybody can be an ed editor. When you say that anybody can be an editor, the students can actually write down in the real time and then they can have an experience which they are lagging right now. Or they're lacking right now the experience of face-to-face -face, uh, teaching. So over here, this can be done and see over here that they can be set background. This is very easy when you want to use Google because Google gives you a provision of Google Classroom. It gives you a provision of Jamboard. It gives you a provision of Google Forms. All these things are being given up by the Google, which is uh, once you have the account, it's easy for you to access them. See, my background has already changed. If I want to use something for maths, it's for the maths teachers. They can use this kind of uh, um, uh, the background where the students can actually write down the, the numbers. Then you have for Hindi if uh, or any other language, whichever language you are using, like you can use these line, line uh, background where they can actually write down anything related to whatever you are teaching. The next one, which I'll be talking about, is for the science students. And it's uh, what has been given by the Indian government. Uh, it's the Amrita Labs, O Labs. Okay. This is the lab in which you get the free simulation. And it's very useful, especially for, and it can be, it's accessible from for everybody and uh, for uh, the physics, chemistry, biology labs from uh, 9 to 12 to, uh, class. And for the teachers, for the future teachers, it is very, very good that you can actually teach the students. There is an interactive simulation, animations, and lab videos are there. Don't show them lab videos. You can actually do a simulation over there because it's, it's easy for them. It's good for them to see that, yes, all these things can happen when they are not there 
in the class they cannot experience certain things in the class in face to face manner but still they can have that simulated feeling same way for the higher graders or for the higher for the university uh, students you know there have been a new uh, virtual lab that has been uh, just uh, just came up from the ministry of education from india and of course it can be used by anywhere i use it from bahrain from the kingdom of bahrain so definitely uh, all the students from uh, philippines and across all the world can also use this virtual lab and it's it's free of cost and you can actually go in to many of the uh, uh you know it's easy it's easy to be used it's e it's accessible it's uh, very much useful and uh, why do we use all these things we use all these things because uh, it is i think i'm still on uh, the jam board right yes so why why do we use these uh, um, uh, you know these online uh, platforms why we we have to use all these online platforms uh, because it's uh, very much important for the students for our students to know and to get interactive and as uh, again i would say i would say that uh, the guest speaker who actually came in um, just before me he had talked about kahoot kahoot is very much prevalent in all the schools it's it's very good it's very easy and how do you play with it it's uh, i'll just show it to you because i just made a kahoot for you all actually you can make the kahoot um, and uh, yes what happens is that uh, the uh, you can make the questions and you can add the pictures over here and obviously you know what happens over there is uh, it's it's easy to be used it's accessible even the kids they nowadays they make kahoot uh uh and what happens is that once you play with them how do you play with with the students uh well while playing with the students you have to just uh, give the code as same in the quizzes also in uh, the kahoot also you give the code to the students and then you uh, just place the uh, the share the uh, sorry share the code in the chat box and then what happens is that you can just show the uh, they can play from their uh, own assistants or their own mobile phones plus they can actually see the uh, the questions from where they are uh, you know using it from their own systems and obviously you can also show your the questions you can show them or share with them through zoom this is all uh, what we use generally in the school and that uh, uh, that actually engages the students very much especially when you are uh, uh, doing the you know the introductory uh, part which is very easy because you are recapping what you have taught earlier and it's easy for them uh, to recall it in a very a nice fashion it's not that you know you are just asking questions and they are giving answers over here everybody is engaged you just tell them that yes this is the pin number and you would see that within a second um, uh, you know 30 all 30 students if you have 30 students in your class generally we have 30 students in our class so all 30 students in your class have just come in and then they would just play and it just takes around two minutes or three minutes and what the, the best part about kahoot is that it gives you
what happened to uh, Mrs. Saha? I think she's frozen. Uh, Mrs. Saha, can we get back to you? Oh, probably there was a technical problem there. Uh, so uh, uh, we will not. Uh, we will just give her time later on if she's not done with her presentation. But we really don't want to waste time now. For those who are already lining up on our parallel sessions, I'm sorry, but uh, you can only be allowed to enter if uh, the, uh, once the plenary session is over. We have to make some adjustments and, uh, you know, it's not a waste of time listening to these wonderful ideas that we got all over the world. So there is Miss Saha once again. So um, have you? are you encountering any technical difficulties there, uh, Miss oh, Saha? No, actually, suddenly, just now, now you see, you know, uh, So there, you're frozen again, Mrs. Uh, uh, am, I, am I there? Am I there? Right yeah, now? you're all right. You're fine right now. You can proceed, please. Okay, thank you so much. Now, I, what I was saying is that this can happen with your students also. Suddenly, you know, they might just go woof when you're teaching them. So, but then you need to be ready with so many other things, and you, uh, your your class needs to be very much engaging now one i personally use is one more uh, very nice uh, site which is called live worksheets wait i'll just show it to you yes well while searching for many other things i just came across this um a site which is called live worksheets i'll just show a very simple one uh, for you well just a simple one which i'm showing it to you it's parts of plants okay and uh, if i just it's for kg it's uh, your kg students can also do this You just need to drag and drop. Now, if your students are engaged with you in Zoom session, what you can do is that give them the opportunity through the remote control. And then what happens is that they themselves can do it. You don't have to do anything. You are just as an onlooker. You're just looking at them. But then you are a controller that whom do you have to give the remote control to. The remote control can be given to a particular student or to all of them. If you give it to all of them, it will be a big mess. But yes, what we what I do is that I give it to a particular student. And then we just, you know, two, three times we do or uh, you know uh, this, this this as uh, this we do it after we teach uh, once the, the classroom is done for the activity or for uh, the plenaries we do we do such live worksheets it's very easy it's very accessible and you get the content so easily you can make the content also it's not that it's just the content which is available you can make much of the content also over here and it's a uh, uh, it's available for from KG till grade 12. You can use it. I'm basically talking about the teachers or the future teachers who will be going to the schools and will be teaching them. See, uh, maybe, you know, in Philippines, they must be using so many of these uh, uh, of, of these uh, sites like Kahoot is there, Red Puzzle is there, Quizlet, Quizzes is there, Quizlet is there. Even GeoBoard is a nice uh, uh, one of these uh, sites where the maths uh, teachers can you where the maths teachers can use it and can teach them that yes this is like a square or uh, you know you can uh, actually teach these uh, students different shapes my uh, uh, the, the maths teachers they use them and uh, different sides different uh, shapes uh, which you can use these these are very easy things which i'm just telling you and uh, this is a math learning center org this is called geoboard which is being used by many of our maths teachers these are uh, different kinds of uh, uh, you know 
uh, all the ways that, that we teach uh, to our students and which which we expect from the future teachers also to actually wait, let me just uh, unshare. Yes, which uh, we actually um, try or what we want our future teachers to learn that yes not only through board because we do not know once we go down to the schools and once this uh, pandemic uh, you know it, it uh, lowers down and then when the schools reopen then definitely we won't have the schools as we used to for the, as the way we used to take uh, you know the schools which used to happen but yes we are also expecting in the school education we are also expecting that we would have a hybrid teaching now for hybrid teaching what you as future teachers is required is not just your whiteboard right not whiteboard as in whiteboard which we use in the school but we need you as future teachers we need you to learn more about gamifications to uh, different kinds of uh, learning platforms which are very much required and new future to, you know 21st century skills lastly i'll just uh, share with you my ppt for a moment Wait, uh, just a moment, yes. Well, uh, there are many of the other uh, forms which we, we use. We use Google Forms. We have told you about the Jamboard. Uh, there is Nearpod. Nearpod is very, very, very good uh, where you can actually show the students the video and in, and between the video, you can pop up uh, the questions in uh, in between that only. And then you can actually ask the questions and uh, while playing the video, a normal, vi uh, you know, the YouTube video, uh, they have made in such a way, some of them they have embedded, uh, some of them you can embed it in uh, the Neopod. And then you can actually pose in the questions over there. And then the students will, you don't have to ask the questions in between. It will pop up because you have already embedded the questions in that video itself. You have, I've already told you about the geo board. There is Poplet. Poplet gives you the... Uh, opportunity to make mind maps then you have uh, the diksha just um, uh, launched by the uh, indian government then uh, you have animaker animaker gives you an opportunity to make uh, the you know teach teaching through animation it's very nice you know these these very small small things what you can do with the students to engage them now why do we need all these things we need all these things to you know to make uh, the the class very interactive they're very easy to use they have quick assessment also they are easy to handle they're highly engaging they have real time playing also and obviously they're student oriented they give you a very higher order thinking and learning skills now i will just lastly share with you these 50 instructional strategies which are normally used right now by our store, by the teachers in our school, in our schools or in any other schools also. I'll share it with uh, the uh, with Mrs. Uh, Nid, uh, with Dr. Nidhi Agarwal so that you know she will share it with other students and which you can see and then you can just go ahead with all these uh, kind of instructional 50 instructional strategies. Uh, some of them which we have been using, some of them which are very new. Uh, for us also as teachers and then you can you know implement these things in your real classrooms or in your hybrid classrooms and then you will see the difference that yes what is it all about you know and it definitely brings it uh, you know a big big difference in your teaching learning strategies in your teaching learning skills and obviously you will see that yes your students have been engaging and they've been learning more once they get out of your class it won't be a boring lecture but yes it will be an interactive class
Back to you, MC. Thank you. Dr. Janet, please unmute the microphone. Um, um, Dr. Janet, we cannot hear you. Uh, you're muted, actually. <gasps> Uh, that is actually we are not used to turning on and off ourselves during uh so uh anyway as i was saying uh the keyword really is collaboration and digitalization is really a way for us to collaborate with the students and uh we experience right now that digitalization is challenged by internet connectivity okay uh, sometimes we will be frozen sometimes we will have our students frozen as well but we need to keep our uh, classroom lively and engaging thank you so much mrs Saha. Thank you. Thank now, uh, I know that there are a lot of um, uh, viewers coming all the way from uh, Leyte. Uh, we have students um, from um, uh, Malolos. Uh, I cannot uh, um, read all of these names, but we have a lot. Now, we are on our third speaker. And as I was saying earlier, dear uh, presenters, you please join us in our plenary because um, uh, this is where you hear great minds really prepare to share it with us. What is it that we have to await in this transformational hybrid uh, learning? Good morning. Uh, can we get that back again from LCC? Uh, so... Oh, okay. I wasn't able to catch up what's um, on the feed. Good morning, a blessed Saturday from LCCC. This webinar is very informative. Yes, really. And timely in this time of pandemic. Learning can be fun. Truly, learning can be fun and productive in spite of challenges. Yes, we are flexible. Flexible right now with our time because we want to hear from the wonderful minds of these great speakers. Very informative, according to Verhemia Perez, uh, that we can use in this time of new normal education platform. Maid student from LCUP Malolos, Philippines. Okay, so uh, let us now proceed to our third uh, guest speaker uh, from uh, Kingdom of Bahrain of uh, Mississauga. Now we move on to India. Dr. Mina Bandari. Okay, the Dean of uh, ICFAI University in Dehradun, India. Uh, Dr. Bandari has 30 years of experience in the field of education. She has authored several international and national level research papers and had co-authored uh, a basic education curriculum textbooks. Is that right? Uh, she had been convener of international conferences and workshops as well. She has a lot of, uh, she had gained a lot of uh, feathers on her cup, being able to receive accolades from different uh, award-giving bodies, such as the National Women Excellence Award in 2018 by Northeastern Council Government of India in association with European Chamber of Small and Medium Enterprise, the National Award Professor R.P. Singh Special Educationist Award in 2018, awarded by the Indian Psychometric and Educational Research Association. She also received Certificate of Merit for Outstanding Services in the College of Education, Gaiziabad, in 2014. Then uh, Rachia Gaurav Saman Award in 2013 towards the cause of Hindi language, Indian languages, Indian culture and strengthening the unity of India. She also received the Certificate of Honor for Best Teacher from the DAV Public School Pratap Vihar Gaziabad. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, Dr. Amina Bandari of India. 
Thank you, ma'am. Can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me? Okay. So, good morning, everyone. It is my honor and privilege to be present here as a guest speaker in this international conference organized by Global Education and Research Association in collaboration with La Consolation University of Philippines on a very current and relevant topic of hybrid education. First of all, I would like to convey my thanks to the organizing team for their efforts and giving this opportunity to me. A special thanks to Dr. Nidhi Agarwal, the convener of this conference. Now, I have no presentation here. I just wanted to interact because the speakers before me yesterday and today, they all spoke about the hybrid model, how you can, you know, how the learning, teaching learning process has been transformed and how effectively you can teach your students by this. But what I was thinking about is what are the challenges that are being placed in this type of model vis-a-vis -vis the students, the teachers, and, you know, it just happened overnight. We were having the hybrid form of teaching initially also but if you look at it now it has you know it is being used on a very extensive scale teaching learning has witnessed a major paradigm shift in the recent past and more in a remarkable way since the last one and a half years due to the onset of this pandemic covid 19. now the classes have been replaced by zoom and other online platforms and it was aptly stated somewhere that there is a shift from pedagogy to panicogy. Now, this word panicogy actually forced me to go into the details. Actually, why was this panic all about? And how can we, you know, take uh, measures to get this, uh, 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 to overcome this? And so this transition has brought about a major change in the traditional if you look at the age-old teaching learning process, the lockdowns had forced the teaching to be carried on totally online mode. And with unlocking many new learning, new perspectives, new trends have emerged on the horizon of the education scenario. And if we recall last year, we would be actually heading into the great unknown. The new emerging scenario indicates that COVID-19 has certainly become a catalyst for educational institutions worldwide to search for innovative solutions in a relatively short period of time. Because as the education sector searches for new solutions for the students, it would have been under its wraps the much needed innovation. Now, if we look at the traditional age-old in-person classroom learning, it is now complemented with new learning modalities. The pattern of live broadcast, it has taken up the, the, the position of the virtual reality experiences. The seminars, we, we, if we look at the scene today, the seminars, we are all sitting at such a distance from each other. So these seminars have been replaced by webinars in the current time, which is an ample proof to visualize what future has in store for us. Now, learning has become a habit that is integrated into our daily routine. Now, the academic institutions globally with the ancient lecture-based talk and talk method, the outmoded classrooms have undergone to have undergone certain changes to suit the needs and demands of the students. Now, if we talk about hybrid learning, it goes beyond barriers of time, location, and culture. And it has created many enhanced opportunities for both the learners and the instructors. It endeavors to purposefully and seamlessly integrate online and traditional learning in order to create a distinct, a very new approach with its new merit. 
Now, if we look at hybrid learning, we are using it synonymously with the blended learning. But both are different from each other in a very subtle way. If we look at blended learning, it focuses on the combination between offline and online learning. Hybrid learning is more about finding the right mix for the learner. Like the speaker before me told, for the learners, she was telling, giving the examples of the English teachers, uh, for the English class, for the science class, for the maths class. So hybrid learning is about finding the right mix for the learner of all possibilities in learning, whether it is offline learning or online learning. So it combines the traditional classroom experiences. That is the beauty of hybrid learning. The experiential learning, the objectives, the digital course delivery that focuses on using the best option for each learning objective. If we have heard about inclusive education, inclusive education is actually the same. When we, we have, we are celebrating the diversity, the potential, the different needs of the student in the class. So in this way, they vary widely as per the subject matter taught and the needs of the specific learner. Now the hybrid learning provides a lot of flexibility. That is why it is becoming so popular. And believe me, it is here to stay. The speaker before me very rightly said, even after the pandemic, you know, seizes or subsides, you know, this form of education will definitely be the order of the day. So it is because it provides a lot of flexibility to the students in terms of learning, because it facilitates them to choose the learning method that works best for them on their schedule, their stage, in their respective educational program. And even their individual learning style. If you see, every student has a different learning style. So this sort of education actually caters. We customize it as per the needs of the students. An efficient teacher, of course, should and she or he actually does also. So hybrid learning is flexible, it is self-paced, hence certainly it is more student-centric. It provides an opportunity to the students to get face time, to help with concepts that need extra motivation, extra reinforcement, extra explanation. They, if they require lab time for productive hands-on experience, where warranted and remote interaction to help them with their basic questions. Now, the hybrid approach has become popular, I told you just now, and it is a predominant teaching model for the future, even in the K-12 education as well. Even for those, it is so encouraging to see, for those who do not advocate distance education, they also see the advantage of this approach because it incorporates the best of both worlds offering the convenience, the flexibility of online courses without losing face-to-face -face faculty to student interaction in the classroom. Now, hybrid process or hybrid format is a very evolving process. It will take some time to, you know, we will we'll make improvisations, we will have beautiful changes made in the future to, to suit the changing times. So the motivation for the teachers and for the students should always be there. We should learn to ignore the technical glitches or if the students are not able, that of course I'll be dealing later on. But you know, if, if, I, uh, if I focus on one aspect is we should have a uh, point of uh, we should actually learn to tolerate we should learn to bear all these technical glitches all the problems that the students and the teachers for the students the organization should have a very motivational approach and in turn the teacher should motivate the students so if we if we go on to the challenges of the teachers first let me first see how the role of the teacher has actually been redefined his role hitherto was of a knowledge imparter who 
used to disseminate wisdom, knowledge to the pupils gradually, it has slowly ceased to exist. This is because the students are accessing knowledge from different sources by clicking their phones, their tablets, their computer. Now the teacher is better suited in the new role as facilitator and as in the National Policy of Education 2020 in India, it has focused that the role of the teacher is now of a facilitator for the students who merely assist them in uh, you know, the construction of the knowledge. They should be taught in such a way that they are able to construct the knowledge themselves. The change role of the teacher would also witness the fact that instead of the teacher motivating the student, technology will be the prime motivator for them to learn. This will have an added advantage because the students will be able to contribute in the teaching learning process without peer pressure and without the classroom embarrassment they might be having if they're not able to answer a particular question. Now the popularity and relevance of the hybrid model of teaching is seen because of its greater use of online teaching learning support. Now researchers have proved that the students are more satisfied and learning is more effective by this hybrid instruction. The student experience more convenience, they have better control over the pace. Now good hybrid instruction can incorporate the seven principles of good practice in teaching uh, undergraduate education or developing learning. What are these seven uh, principles? First of all, it promotes interaction between the students and the faculty. Second, it enhances reciprocity and cooperation among the students. They learn to have a healthy competition. They learn to collaborate with each other. Then it promotes active learning. If we, if we uh, visualize a traditional classroom, we will see that there are certain students who are sitting at the back who are not participating. You know, for some reasons, maybe they are weak or they are not able to grasp the content so easily. But here in this model, you can have this principle also being enhanced. The pro it promotes active learning. Then it provides a prompt feedback also. When you get a prompt feedback, then the reinforcement and motivation is always building up. Then increases time on task also. Then it sets up high expectations. The students are motivated. They are able to do this task. They are motivated. They get the reinforcement. And they, are, they, they set up high expectations for themselves. Even the teachers set up high expectations for the students. And the main problems in the class is when we are not able to cater to the diversity in the learning that is there in the class. The students are from diverse backgrounds. They have diverse potential. When we are able to customize our teaching, when we are able to cater to that diversity, the classroom becomes more effective. So the hybrid mode of instruction, since it uses a face-to-face -face and online learning activities, it has been found to increase a lot of understanding, a lot of involvement in the teaching learning process. Now, let me get to the challenges now, which actually motivated me to you know, present this uh, before you, my thoughts before you, and maybe many of you may agree with, and many of you might ponder over it. And if you are in a position, you can actually work upon it and try to overcome these challenges. So there are many. The biggest challenge is that the hybrid courses does not fit easily into the organizational structure of higher education. We are not used to it. But this is ruling the rules. This is the call of the day. So we should, as quickly as possible, try to make some organizational changes. So it is important that there is readiness on the part of the organization and institutional support for it. It requires many players besides the organization, the individual, all the stakeholders, the individual faculty members, 
the the other players the colleges the infrastructure the departments the other support services so it is expected we are expecting a lot from the faculties to deliver so much but are we providing them the much needed organizational support have we not let them to fend for themselves you know so we have to think on those lines so yeah, because we are expecting the faculty that they accomplish the multiple roles uh, like transformation in the course reexamining course goals developing online and face to face activities which are integrated and aligned with these goals then finding ways to uh, to assess the students to evaluate the students understanding them then have a mastery on the course material and creating ways and means for the students to interact with them so it is expected of them to take on a, a, a you know to take on a change as far as pedagogy is concerned as far as socially also the teachers are expected to be a collaborative community of learners they should be imparting their best so that the students are actually attracted they are you know they are actually very concentrated and attentive when the teachers are teaching so as course managers they are responsible for scheduling the activities for determining the due dates and grading assignments and then you know the technology they have to be very technical or very techno savvy and they have to orient the students to the course management so if you are expecting such a lot from the teacher we all of us here in this conference they we are all associated with the teaching fraternity so we should actually give a thought to all these problems so in order to achieve the desired result the faculty has to be prepared in a manner that they can effectively design and administer the the hybrid instruction the biggest challenge as i told you just now not every faculty member has the knowledge the skills and attitudes to teach a technology based learning courses and in many case the faculty do not receive the necessary pedagogical and technical training now this is a really a very grim situation they are often forced to seek the out assistance on their own and at their own cost also so faculty training is critical for quality online education not only should universities offer training to the faculties but they should also provide faculty with the opportunity to experience online instruction most and then you know another problem that came to my mind is that most of the time the faculties are overburdened there should be efforts to have reduction in their workload they should be given time to learn new technologies to prepare new courses to have these uh, you know the courses suit the hybrid instructions uh, then providing financial support also to them to give them grants to give them incentive then institution can also establish venues for faculties to share the experiences with the use of technology we can have conferences we can have and this conference is very good because the speakers are actually sharing what they are teaching what is the effective way in which they can teach the students from different uh, you know in different classes now if we come to the students let us understand the position of the students also in order we blame the students that they are not paying attention they just log in they are not there physically present in the class but have we actually oriented the students this all happened overnight and it took the hybrid education took a big leap so how can we expect students very small students to you know fall into the actually be in the groove and start you know responding as you want them to respond so in order that the objectives of hybrid education are achieved in terms of learning outcome students are also required to be worked upon for many students it may be that first exposure to such a learning format hence 
they should be provided with technical and learning support though they are very good they are very techno savvy now because they are using those android phones but still we should give them some formal training it should be ensured that students are comfortable using the tools on the website such as posting on the discussion forums submitting assignments online taking online quizzes how to prepare these quizzes how to fill those google forms so it is important to explain to students what hybrid learning is what is its purpose what are its objectives and to familiarize with them uh, them with the course website they should be given some tips on study and they should be given time management skill training also some students are used to self responsibility that goes with learning material independently online so breaking assignments down into smaller steps then providing reminders about upcoming due dates for assignment can help the students to stay on the task and one thing the teachers can also do is the teacher should see that the class size is not a barrier for many students for participation because many students are very you know they they are they are actually afraid of speaking and answering questions when the classes are very large to help reduce this problem half of the students could be excused from the class to work on the online assignment while the other half they are actually in the class doing more interactive projects so we can use the time judiciously the students can be kept engaged so this can create a smaller and a more comfortable classroom climate because a classroom climate is very very important in order to give any sort of instruction the teacher is actually responsible for creating this classroom which will increase the part participation and more interaction and will develop higher order thinking or the divergent thinking in the school so trends have shown that hybrid education is the future it is here to stay which can be a great way to prepare the educators and instructors for making the transition to online the traditional environment in which face to face instruction takes place no matter how intensively technology is used has some major instruction but some of these restrictions are limited one to one teacher student uh, interaction the delayed feedback that is given to the student and the limitation in the visual aids and materials that the instructors can use in the class one of the biggest merit of hybrid is it provides a viable option for students it is very interesting thing it goes to them very naturally also because they are used to you know being on the social media being uh, you know on the phones all the time so you know we can take advantage of it but there are certain things which can be formally and officially given to them they are trained. in india of course the honorable vice president also 3 days ago in a speech has actually said that all teachers all educators should find a good model of hybrid education so in india we are actually going to work on it and that is what the major thrust of national policy of education 2020 in india is actually uh, you know the thrust is on so this is a relevant topic therefore i i uh, just wanted to you know to have some food of thought also for everyone so that we can think about it and if we are in a position we can actually get going take it forward and have these changes made in order to make lives of the teachers lives of the students very easy and to make this hybrid model actually very effective so this was all thank you so much for giving me this opportunity thank you so much dr bandari you really captured the challenges that we have right now with the uh, drastic uh, paradigm shift in uh, the educational uh, scenario and yes we agree with you that technology is a great motivator of student learning and that uh, is a challenge because of organizational uh, support so we need to have infrastructure uh, because we were caught 
by surprise by these changes. So uh, everybody who is inside that uh, physical structure of the school had to go virtually. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bandari. To uh, move on, we are going to our very own Dr. Maria Cristina Elma Zulueta, the current Dean of La Consolacion University, Philippines. College of Medicine, which is the first college of medicine in the province of Bulacan. Prior to this appointment, she was the college secretary of UERMMCI College of Medicine for nine years and head of the Department of Anatomy for almost two years. She finished a master's degree in public health, major in clinical epidemiology of UERMMCI graduate studies in 2008. Before her appointment in LCUP College of Medicine, she was already on the implementation of her approved thesis on uh, creating a readiness tool for cadaveric dissection for her Master's of Science in Health Science Education. Her passion to be an academician prevailed over her clinical practice as an obstetrician gynecologist she is currently enrolled to the Doctor of Philosophy major in Educational Leadership and Management Program of LCUP Graduate Studies. Dr. Zalueta is not just a proud academic scholar and honor graduate of UE Manila and the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center College of Medicine. She was also born in UERM Hospital. How is that for loyalty since birth? mentored by an excellent anatomy professor and former dean of UERMMCI College of Medicine, Dr. Esperanza Silanzang. Uh, Dr. Zolueta had been sever uh, to several review centers all over the country, reviewing medical graduates in human anatomy, gross anatomy, histology, and neuroanatomy in preparation for the physical a physician, I'm sorry, physician licensure examination. She has been a consistent recipient of the Dean Esperanza Lanzang, best teacher in the basic sciences during her 15 years of teaching in UERM College of Medicine. Dr. Zalueta has presented and published researches on medical education. She has been a consistent figure, especially as judge in the Asia Pacific Medical Education Conference organized by the National University of Singapore and Duke School of Medicine annually. She is also one of the Philippine representatives of the Asia Pacific Med Biomedical Sciences Educators Association headed by the National University of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Maria Cristina Izalueta, MD, MSPH, DPSA, FPOGS. Good morning, Dr. Zalueta. To share with you on how La Consolacion University Philippines College of Medicine being the first college of medicine in the province of Bulacan, aligned the Doctor of Medicine program to local and global standards. Before I start, I would like to disclose that I will be discussing the topic within the perspective of the LCUP College of Medicine, being the first college of medicine in Bulacan, Philippines. I declare no conflict of interest and I'm not representing any governing educational institution nor any accrediting agencies. My presentation will cover the following objectives. At the end of the presentation, the participants will be able to describe the Philippine medical education then and now. Identify the key factors in aligning or realigning the Doctor of Medicine program to local and global standards based on the La Consolation University of Philippines College of Medicine experience. And lastly, discuss of course the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic 
to Philippine medical education. The Philippine medical education has always been patterned after the United States medical education. In the last 10 years, the curriculum of the Doctor of Medicine program transformed from a competency-based curriculum to the recent mandate of the Commission on Higher Education to apply the outcome-based education strategy. This is indeed the effect of globalization and internationalization of education. Set program outcomes were identified to standardize the minimum knowledge and skills expected of graduates of the program. This was on full mandate by the Commission on Higher Education in the hope to ensure our doctor's eligibility to practice not just in the Philippines, but at least in other Asian countries like Singapore and Malaysia. This was seen on a CHED Memorandum Order 18 series of 2016. Here are the 10 program outcomes expected of graduates of the Doctor of Medicine program in the Philippines. It clearly shows that being clinically competent is not enough, but doctors must also learn to collaborate with other members of the healthcare team. There's also emphasis on the adherence to ethical, professional, and legal standards. In aligning the Doctor of Medicine program to local standards, given that La Consolacion University of Philippines is a Catholic university, we added another program outcome for our students, and that is to practice Augustinian teachings and core values. In our implementation of the curriculum, we ensured that these Augustinian core values are linked to the practice of medicine. Our students were able to interview doctors who served remote areas of the country, as well as doctors who just passed the physician licensure exam to give them a glimpse of the real life experiences of a physician. Most of our students are established allied medical professionals. Some already have their own pharmacy or even medical laboratories. This was given much importance in coming up with applied and more collaborative teaching and learning activities, like virtual interview with real patients, even during the time of the pandemic. Even with the proximity to the national capital region, Bulacan still lacks doctors and collaboration with the local government unit-owned hospital Bulacan Medical Center as the college-based hospital led to the students' access, access rather to varied cases and patients. All higher education institutions in the Philippines must comply or must ensure adherence to the policy standards and guidelines set by the Commission on Higher Education, as in our case, that of Shed Memorandum Order 18, series of 2016. So short of saying that we had to comply with all the stipulations on this Shed Memorandum Order. How about aligning with global standards? Following whatever is mandated by the Commission on Higher Education is already part of this alignment. But in addition, membership to the Association of Philippine Medical Colleges Foundation Incorporated allows the college to be attuned to recent developments on medical education, not just locally, but internationally. Most of our faculty are officers, if not affiliated with both local and international medical societies. Most of us have been teaching in well-established medical schools prior to LCUP College of Medicine. 
I, and the rest of the faculty are regular attendees, participants, judge, organizers in international conferences, especially on medical education. Since the standards of our local accrediting body, PAASCU, is aligned with the standards of the World Federation of Medical Education, following their accreditation criteria and standards make us align to global standards. And their standards would require acquisition and upgrading of laboratories and facilities like that of the power laboratories, electric microscopes, and of course, the students' access to simulators. Lastly, ensuring that the foundational knowledge and skills are reiterated as the students progress to the next year level, like the spiral curriculum model of the United Kingdom and that of the Duke National University of Singapore Medical School aligns the curriculum to global standards. The focus on graduating doctors to be primary healthcare providers has always been part of the medical curriculum of the United Kingdom. Everything that we have done and are currently doing lead to how we envision our graduates to be. That they are doctors, who are clinically competent, empathetic, holistically trained to manage patients, both in the hospital and community setting, rendering humble and generous service. This has been summarized into one phrase by our university president, that they are doctors with a heart. I am proud to say that the key factors in aligning the Doctor of Medicine program to local and global standards based on the La Consolacion University of Philippines College of Medicine experience are the following. Strong administrative and community support. This has been clearly seen on the prompt action of the LCUP administrators in all our compliance. The support of teaching and non-teaching personnel of LCUP is also overwhelming. Second, without the collaboration with the local government unit, especially during the time of the pandemic, given the need for virtual patient exposure, hospital admitting conferences, teaching rounds, and access to qualified faculty, all of this would not have been possible without this collaboration or strong local government support. Lastly, delivery of instruction and the implementation of the curriculum would not have been commendable for our students without qualified, passionate faculty sharing a common vision, most especially during these pandemic times. Since we are all discussing about transformation in hybrid perspective because of COVID-19, let me discuss briefly on the impact of COVID-19 to Philippine medical education or the implementation of the Doctor of Medicine program. The pandemic showed us the need for more doctors and allied medical professionals. We have graduated a good number of doctors in the Philippines but this is still not enough to cover all areas of the country. Because of blended learning or virtual teaching and learning, students studying in the provinces had access to experienced professors and experts nationwide, if not anywhere or everywhere in the world. The sharing of knowledge and expertise about COVID-19 and its management was very evident during these pandemic times. And as mentioned earlier, there was a refocus or realignment on what were identified as core knowledge and skills. 
are we teaching too much basic science, like anatomy? What skills are really needed? What core skills must be retained? And of course, the identified outcome, as mentioned earlier, that we graduate doctors to be primary health care providers, that they are trained to prevent and manage patients both in the community and hospital setting. This has always been part of the kind of graduates that LCUP College of Medicine envisions its graduates to be. We definitely had to do a lot of transformation since the pandemic started, especially on the way we teach and learn in medical school. But regardless of any transformation, La Consolación University Philippines, but its College of Medicine, is firm on the kind of doctors that we envision our students to be. That they will be physicians who will not just treat the disease, but great physicians who will treat the patient holistically who has the disease. Holding the patient's hand when appropriate, spending time to explain and to listen and, of course, showing real compassion and care with humility. Truly, doctors with a heart. From La Consolacion University, Philippines, College of Medicine, thank you for this opportunity. God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Zilueta. We cannot uh, wait till you graduate our the pioneer um, uh, students, the pioneer doctors of La Consolacion University Philippines. Uh, I, uh, that is really um, a historic event, uh, considering that we really need a lot of doctors right now. Thank you, Dr. Zilueta. Uh, doctors okay. with a heart. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker, uh, before I introduce the next speaker, there was a question as to um, the uh, certificates during the plenary. Yes, uh, you will be given, those who are not presenters but had attended the plenary, you can just access the link on the evaluation, which will be uh, flashed on your screen later on. And then it will generate a uh, personalized certificate or a certificate for you. So there will be a um, uh, generation. It will be uh, generated computer, gen digital um, generation of your certificates. So you just have to uh, complete the evaluation form. And um, uh, there will be some announcements before we proceed to the parallel session. So I hope the presenters will still be here uh, before I make the um, uh, announcements. So now to proceed, we have another um, um, another distinguished um, speaker from the Philippines. Uh, she is the Vice President for Academics and Research uh, from the Mater Dei Academy Philippines, Dr. Maribel Argaite, uh, MBA. Uh, Dr. Maribel Argaite is a senior lecturer of research and evaluation at the College of Education, University of the Philippines, Diliman, and concurrently the Vice President for Academics and Research at Mater Dei Academy, a STEM-oriented mission school in Santa Maria, Bulacan. She is a graduate of Doctor of Philosophy and Education major in research and evaluation, from the University of the Philippines, and currently the president of the Philippine Association of Mixed Methods Researchers and Emergent Scholars, as well as an active member of the Mixed Methods International Research Association. Her major research interests are in mixed methods research, critical realist evaluation, and school turnaround management and evaluation as a volunteer teacher and administrator for 12 years now. She also assists other turnaround nonprofit schools and with her husband, attorney, 
Manuel uh, Gaite spear, uh, spearheads the Parish Renewal Experience Prex Program in the Philippines. Let's hear the topic presentation of our guest next uh, guest speaker with the title Critical Realism as a Path to Transformative Research. Dr. Gaite, the spotlight is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much. May I know if you can hear me clearly? Um, Dr. Uh, Gaite, yes, very well. Okay, thank you. May I now share my slides? Can you see my slide well? Dr. Gaiten, yes, see we can slide. see your slide earlier, but now yeah. I don't see your slide. Oh. Uh, kindly tell me if it's now uh, visible from your end. Yes, we can see your slide very clearly, Dr. Gaite. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, good day, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to join this conversation. My topic is actually transforming our evaluative thinking to transform the world, this uh, post-normal world. All of us are familiar with the daily ravages of this pandemic and that has shaken the world to its core. With its spread and mutations, COVID-19 without doubt, has thrown the whole world into crisis and has forced upon our society a painful transformation. The vulnerability of the human situation. And as this pandemic continues to take millions of lives and disrupt livelihoods in every corner of the world, the people in the poorest countries are likely to suffer the most and suffer the longest. According to IMF, for instance, the inequitable distribution of vaccines has allowed the virus to continue spreading. Indeed, the striking variations in COVID-19 outcomes uh, I think uh, we are having uh, problems because of intermittent um, internet connectivity. Um, Dr. Uh, Gaite, you are frozen yes, yes. also. Are we have we are having problem on internet connectivity on your end, uh, Dr. Gaite? Is that right? Uh, uh, where did I leave off? Uh, you are on the right slide, but uh, there is um, what's this? Uh, you're frozen at some points. Okay. Um. Let me let me uh, go back a little bit and uh, say that uh, really these striking variations in COVID-19 outcomes. Can you hear me now? We do. Yes, we do. Yes, uh, Dr. Gaite. Thank you for telling me, uh, Madam MC. Okay. Outcomes appear to reflect existing economic inequalities, according to World Bank. The remarkable mismatches between the social value of what key workers do and the low wages they receive follow from the familiar failure of the market to value adequately what really matters. So this crisis then is a revelation of the many injustices and weaknesses that already exist in how we live together. And if people were blind to these faults before, it is hard not to see them now. What will the world look like after COVID-19? According to scientists, many of the problems we will face in the next decade will simply be more extreme versions of those that we already confront today. The world will only look significantly different this time if we emerge 
from this crisis, we decide to take action to resolve these problems and bring about fundamental change. Indeed, now is the time to be radical in our thinking about how to innovate society for the common good and use new technologies and the lessons we are learning from this crisis. According to Sergio Ribello, international finance professor from Northwestern University, the most important lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic is the importance of working together on problems that affect the entire human race. We are much stronger united than divided. We realize that these kinds of global events can only be solved if we work together as a world community. The economic problems from this pandemic are much broader and deeper, striking the poor much harder, and the reasons are obvious. Rich families have the resources to not work and still feed and protect their families. On the other hand, parents from poor families who depend on daily wages to feed their children have no choice but to go out and work. Their children who do not have computers, nor cell phones, nor adequate connectivity have fallen on the wayside. Through online learning, education has become all the more a privilege of the few. In most countries, remote learning has also meant an increase in failing grades for the most vulnerable students. Even in the Philippines, an unprecedented number of students have gone off the radar, even as teachers try to track them down. Many parents are saying that while remote education has worked for some families, most children have struggled. The toll on mental health and well-being of students who are holed up at home, exposed to the glare of their computer screens, is a mounting problem to schools. To us educators, the question remains, how can we reinvent ourselves to do quality education in a new way? We need to ask ourselves, what value do we offer as teachers, as researchers, as program evaluators, and how do we do that in these trying times? Let me share with you our humble experience as volunteers in Mater Day Academy, a mission school in Bulacan, Philippines. Like most private schools in our country, we too have experienced how hard it was to teach and care for online learners, especially those who only use data or had flickering connectivity like me from where they live and attend synchronous classes. Just like in the parable of the sower, some of the seeds of learning that our teachers did their best to sow appeared to have fallen on the path and the birds ate it. These were students who could no longer enroll due to the harsh economic realities from the pandemic that affected their families. Some seeds fell on rocky ground where there was little soil. These were probably our students who had very little connectivity. About 60% of our students have at some point missed their synchronous classes due to internet, internet disruptions. The seed soon sprouted, but when the sun came up, it burnt the young plants. These students would have wanted to learn more, but their on and off Wi-Fi was just too frustrating for them, dousing their interest to study. Some seeds fell among thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the plants. These were those students who, while they had good connectivity, got lured by online games and resorted to procrastination, resulting in unfinished asynchronous tasks. Thankfully, there were some seeds which fell on good soil and the plants produced corn. They were the learners who had enough inner drive and self-discipline to succeed as online learners despite the challenges they had to hurdle as well as those students whose parents had time or made time to supervise their child's progress. We noticed that there were good num a good number of students who used to perform well, but somehow did not do as well in online learning, despite our repeated follow-ups. 
This led us to devise for this media what we call CRISP program or Customized Responsive Intervention for Student Progress. Under this program, each student who did not do well for a certain quarter during the year was given customized online mentorship for those quarterly topics to make sure that they would still have the learning competencies needed for the next school year. And this time, we are making sure that there is a parent or guardian nearby to help ensure that the child is really attending the crisp online class. It's not easy, but I believe it's rewarding to both the student and the teacher. I, for one, as a teacher, ended up mentoring one grade 11 student for five hours every Saturday, teaching him practical research one or qualitative research, both in English and in Filipino. He used to be hard to track down for synchronous online classes, according to his teacher. Now, he's the one who tracks me down every Saturday because it's one-on-one. -on -one. I get to even teach him the other fundamental skills, which I noticed he needed to work on and which a teacher handling a bigger class can no longer sufficiently attend to. For example, a much needed lesson in communication skills, both oral and written. I even coach him about other important things like how to speak his mind, what are his rights as a child and as a student. Because he appears to have low self-esteem, I even told him about what I learned from the movie Karate Kid, that there are no bad students, only bad teachers. But of course, I don't say that to just any student. We always pray before and after our class and our prayer is, thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Teach us to love you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength and with all our soul. And each time we pray that with our students, our inner questions are transformed from what can we do to what can we not do together with you, Lord? That prayer never fails to renew our drooping spirit in these hard times in the face of the myriads of challenges we face as a small school. Proust wrote that the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Fundamental changes are taking place in how we produce knowledge, how we communicate it, and indeed, what we consider to be knowledge. These changes demand innovative and creative responses to research questions. The time has come for us to explore the world, not only with new methods, not only with a new approach to methodology itself, but more importantly, with a new openness of mind and of heart as a lifelong learner ourselves. Peter Drucker, the great management consultant, once said, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, it is to act with yesterday's logic. This calls for us to develop epistemic humility as a habit of thought. As an intellectual virtue, epistemic hum humility is grounded in the realization that our knowledge is always provisional and incomplete and that it might require revision in light of new evidence. Indeed, this pandemic is leading us all to reflect on how we think and do things, among them is in the area of program evaluation. How should we transform our evaluative thinking to be transformative agents of change in this post-normal time? I would like to make use of an infamous remark by Donald Rumsfeld, former U.S. Department of Defense Secretary, on the unpredictability of policy choices as a forewarning on the perils that lay ahead in devising the coronavirus response from the different spheres of our endeavors. There are known knowns. These are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know but there are also unknown unknowns. These are things we do not know, we don't know. 
Rumsfeld was greatly ridiculed because of these words, yet in the opinion of leading realist research methodologists and development evaluators, it is an inadvertent masterpiece of methodology for it provides a succinct benchmark against which all social and public policy should be tested. It warns us that all interventions will be imperfect and fallible. Some of the underlying ideas will work as expected. Some will misfire because they were imperfect. And some challenges will crop up that were never, never contemplated. It provides a rather daunting template with which to evaluate national responses to the COVID-19 outbreak, but it is a challenge that we cannot run from. Similar to Johari Window, and as Rumsfeld might put it, we need to be busy converting scores of known unknowns into known knowns, but in the last analysis, it is necessary to acknowledge that our best laid plans lie in peril from unknown unknowns. This is the wisdom of complexity aware evaluations, which I believe is appropriate in this time of grave uncertainties. Amid this complexity, what type of wisdom do we need to have to help bring about more positive changes ahead? Not only do we need the will to sustain individual, political, and structural changes, many argued, but also a certain set of psychological strategies promoting sound judgment. These include perspective taking, critical thinking, recognizing the limits of our knowledge, and let us not forget, sympathy and compassion. In other words, experts recommended wisdom focuses on metacognition or reflective thinking, which underlies mindfulness, successful management of our emotions, and wiser judgment about complex social issues and problems. Indeed, public health responses across communities and countries have been prolific, but the successes of these interventions are uneven. As always, we need to know what works, for whom, in what circumstances, and in what respects. This is critical realist thinking. Public health programs do not provide panaceas. They work under particular applications, in particular contexts, for particular groups, in particular respects, over particular durations. And the great challenge is to identify these contingencies and to maximize effectiveness across every particular. Allow me to com combine some of the great ideas in development evaluation from the great program evaluators, Dr. Michael Quinn Payton and realist evaluators, Ray Pozon and Nick Tilly. This is about a different kind of evaluation logic to be applied in this time of grave and complex dynamic situation where we are experiencing local and global turbulence. The approaches to planning and project implementation, as well as organizational management of the past, used past logic that assumed a fairly stable world where we could plan our work and work our plan, but we don't live in that world anymore. We live in a place of great dynamism and turbulence with things changing rapidly, and so we need evaluation approaches for a post-normal world. We should already be trying to extract lessons from this pandemic for a global emergency that some scientists are speculating that we have just 10 years to 2030, which is a point of no return on climate change. According to Dr. Patton, we need an evaluation approach that is more action oriented, recognizing that what we learn in real time informs our future, but that we never know perfectly how things are going to turn out. The evidence is never absolute. So what we have increasingly turned to is what we call evaluative thinking, being able to weigh evidence, being able to think about the pros and cons of evidence, because in reality, we do not get absolute answers in most cases. What we get, as shown by this pandemic, 
is different countries taking different approaches because they face different situations, have different health systems, have different political systems, have different cultural systems, have different educational systems. And so you can't have one size fits all that works everywhere in the world on anything. What we have done in the past with logic models and with smart goals that have been dominant in evaluation is try to come up with what were called best practice models that could be taken to scale around the world. But now we are much more in a world where there aren't models that can be generalized everywhere, but that what we have to do is ongoing learning within a context about what works, for whom, in what ways, under what conditions in that context. That means that the question of evaluation has changed from the overall summing up question of effectiveness. Does the program work? Is it effective? To this more nuanced, adaptable question, what works, where, for whom, under what conditions, with what consequences, in what context? Let us aim to help people think in terms of systems to think in terms of mechanisms of change, interrelationships, perspectives, emergence, non-linearities, the things that go in a complex dynamic system that requires a different form of evaluation. And then we need to take what is learned in these different efforts at the level of principles and help adapt principles to new sites and contexts, not as rigid recipes, but at the level of principle rather than at the level of detailed practice. Finally, let us not see this pandemic merely as a new normal, but rather as a newness of life that calls us to live in a new way, a new way of valuing life, a new way of caring for ourselves, caring for one another and caring for the earth. We need to learn to live in this new life with courage, to face the known as well as the unknown unknowns. Let us have the will not only to survive, but to help one another reinvent ourselves to live a full life. There is a God who walks with us and who knows beyond what we know and do not know. We may have to suffer today the loneliness of physical distance from one another. But let us not give up trying to find safe ways to still touch each other's hearts and bless one another in this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gaite. Uh, we have to remember the parable of the sower, uh, the seed, the learning, the soil, the learner, and the sower, the teacher. And that would be our tool in uh, being more compassionate with our uh, students. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gaite. Thank you. Now, we come to the uh, last but not the least speaker, um, Mr. Fermin Antonio D.R. Yabut, CPA, MSPA. But uh, Professor Fermin used to be a senior associate and a quality control consultant. Uh, do we have uh, Mr. Yabut on uh, in the room? Yes, Bob. Yes, Bob. Okay. He's available, okay. Dr. Chan. So uh, let me continue. Uh, he, he used to be, let me start over. Professor Fermin used to be a senior associate and a quality control consultant for public accounting firms in the Philippines. He has served as the deputy director of the UST Publishing House and the inaugural chair of the Accounting Information System Department of the same university. Currently, Vermeen is the Mr. Vermeen is the uh, pedagogical lead of the UST, UST Alfredo M. Villayo College of Accountancy. He was awarded professor, uh, professional grants to craft development programs on OBTL in accounting programs and governance and ethics by the Philippine Institute of Certifi uh, Certified Public Accountants, where he also serves as a resource speaker for the same topics. 
His research interests include the international accounting education standards, scaffolding in the international accounting. Uh, uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, scaffolding in accounting courses, audit pricing. He has written book on accounting and several theoretical and literary essays. Recently, one of his literary works was included in Ani 41 the official literary journal of the Cultural Center of the Philippines. He obtained his bachelor's degree and teacher's certificate from UST. Mr. Fermin also obtained his graduate degree in professional accounting from the Steelman School of Business of the Seton Hall University, where he has been elected as a member of the Beta Gamma Sigma, the International Scholastic Honor Society for AACSB accredited business schools. Currently, he is working for his doctorate degree in leadership studies in the Loyola Schools of the Ateneo de Manila University. To present this topic titled Teachers Leading in a VUCA World, VUCA World, let's welcome Professor Fermin Antonio D.R. Yabut, CPA, MSPA. Good morning, everyone. Colleagues, welcome to my talk about transformation in higher education, hybrid, hybrid perspective, futuristic approach. But particularly, I will reflect on the transformation of teachers, learners, and higher education institutions. I'm firm in. I'm the pedagogical lead of the USD Alfredo and Velayo College of Accountancy. As the pedagogical lead, I'm in charge of the design, implementation, and evaluation of programs and courses in the college. Before we go into a deep dive of the content, I want you to look at this particular comic strip from Archie Comics. The first time I saw this, I thought this was a comic strip um, released in our current time 2021 but apparently this has been released in 1997 um i think the resemblance of the situation with our um with our situation right now is rather uncanny which reminds me of this particular quote by t.s Eliot in four quartets time past and time future what might have been and what has been point one and which is always present. As we intimate about the question, when will the future happen? I think it's also important for us to understand that sometimes time is not as linear as we perceive it to be. Portions and packets of the future are already happening right now. So if the question is, when will the future happen? particularly when you talk about futuristic hybrid approaches, maybe the answer is the, the future has already happened. It is and the ability of the leaders and the teachers to identify these particular packets of changes that will lead to transformation in the future. And that particular ability to identify, I think, is the strength of our transformation as an organization. In plain language, environmental scanning. Leaders must be able to perform environmental scanning to understand what are the current what are the current um, factors right now happening right now that, when magnified in the future, will definitely lead to the transformation of our landscape in higher educational institutions. I think I might have preempted already my discussion earlier when I talked about environmental scanning. When you talk about the transformation of organizations, particularly higher education institutions, we have to understand that there are views of change in which, in which rather change is actually a process rather than a static event, rather than a single event, change is a process. We can refer to Jacobs and colleagues' change model for this particular view of change. So, as a process, change will have inputs. That particular input will come from our scanning of the environment. Particularly, when we do um, PESEL analysis, for example, or, or whatever scanning tool that we use. 
what is the environment right now and how do we see the environment changing as we go to the future after that particular environmental scanning it's very important for us to understand here is our um, organi uh, here is our organization the internal structure of our organization here is our vision or the view of the future is there a fit or misfit if there is a fit then well and good you don't need change but if there is a misfit especially if this is the level of the organization right now and this is this um this is the a uh, vision of the future for example well there is a gap very important for us to identify the gap when we look at the input process the, the input um the input side of the change why because the gap will trigger the will trigger the transformation of the organization as we want to align the organization to our vision of the future so after that we have identified already there is a misfit this is now where we strategize how do we change uh, particularly if we want to how do we transform rather the organization particularly if we want to um, bring the organization to the future this is where leadership will definitely have to factor in during the throughput of the of the change process the leaders must be able to anticipate where resistance will come in um, resistance will definitely come in um, anchoring on jacobs and colleagues resistance will come in if um, the followers or the people inside the organization feel that their vision, their own vision of organizational identity is not in line with the change. So leaders play a key role here in understanding the sources of resistance, the packets of resistance, and how to make sure that those packets and those issues of resistance are, are factored in as we um, enact the change and definitely the output of change very simple the output is renewed organizational performance or an organizational performance aligned with our vision of the future as we have identified earlier this particular phase is very important because this is where the leaders will understand have we created a fit or are we at least in the process of creating a fit if there's still a misfit the um, information here will feed into the input side of the subsequent environmental scanning and then we again ask the question is there a fit is there a misfit what are the changes that we have to capture when we view change as something like this something on a very general level on the meso and the macro level we might have taken for granted the micro level the micro level aspects of change which we will discuss in the subsequent slides the transformation of our teachers and the transformation of our learners assuming now that we have a renewed vision and our vision our organizational vision now encapsulates or includes our vision of the future one crucial aspect for the success of um, seeing that vision come to life is I think getting the buy-in of the people change definitely is something based from my personal experience change the prospects of change at that even is something scary scary I should say something that could make people uncomfortable so it is it is the role of the leader to get the buy-in of the people to get them to that vision to get them to appreciate that vision especially r right now that we are um, facing a lot of uncertainties from the environment complexities at that ambiguities and volatilities i think before we can transform our academic staff our teachers at that it's very important for the leaders to effectively communicate the vision to them get their buy-in to that particular renewed vision and then we can talk about changing our um, academic staff in changing our academic staff or in transforming our academic staff as we prepare them to be um, competitive also in the future i'd like to borrow from the intentional change model by boyatzis um, taken from the book 
a primal leadership by Goldman Boyatzis and Maki. So, the first step is that we have to identify what are the competencies for the future. And this identification is not only on, our, on an, or in an organizational level. We have to involve our people. We have to involve our academic staff. Question one is about, or a phase one is about, what is your ideal self? That particular self who is aligned with our vision of the future. So definitely, we have we must be able to identif identify the competencies for the future, um, the competencies needed for our academic staff as we bring them to the future. We don't just bring <laughs> we don't just bring people to the future without equipping them. Definitely, we have to equip them. So we start with number one, um, starting with our vision of our teachers or uh, of um, actually of our teachers' visions of themselves is actually quite inspirational. So that's why we start with the ideal self. And then using the uh, change model by Boyatzis, we now have to bring back our academic staff. We have to bring back our teachers in the current situation. But what are your current competencies? At some point, comparing the ideal and the real self can create some sort of disjuncture, expectation versus what's actually real. And that's intended in the model. That particular item, that particular um, gap between the ideal and the current self is actually useful in the model because it will trigger the third one, the learning agenda. So how do we bridge the gap? This is where the organization will have to, um, will have to play a key role. So how do we enact the learning agenda? For example, one of the trends that we see right now and definitely will have to stay in the future is uh, game-based learning, for example. Game-based learning has been the byword for quite some time already because of its advantages, especially right now that we are um, undertaking, um, we are deploying online learning, at least in the Philippines. And, we, uh, and this is actually a very good time for us to experiment, to experiment and um, deploy uh, game-based learning pedagogies. But my question is, have we equipped our teachers or academic staff for this particular types of change? Especially that um, game-based learning, for example, is something not quite similar even with the active learning pedagogies. So how do we, how do we bridge that gap? Well, we want to use that pedagogy in class, for example, but do we, how do we um, equip our teachers? There's no one-size-fits-all answer for this particular type of question. But rather, we have to be sensitive to the fact that before we can enact these changes inside the classroom, inside the organization, we have to equip our teachers. The learning agenda. On the part of the teacher, we must as teachers, we must imbibe that notion of lifelong learning as long as, as long as we live, as long as we teach, as long as we work, we have to learn. You know, just on the side, if people will always ask me, how do I want myself to be described? I, I'd say very simple. I'm the perennial amateur lifelong learner. Amateur in the sense that from the um, from the root word ama meaning love because I want to do things out of love rather than out of um, out of um, obligation or so, of sorts but out of love and a perennial learner because as teachers we are actually really called to a life of learning you know? and a life of learning will always include unfiltering our filters being conscious about the filters that we use and being conscious as well that those filters will create a bias. After laying down, after understanding of our filters as teachers, even our filters as acad um, academic administrators, then we can truly understand our real selves vis-a-vis -vis the ideal self and the learning agenda. Now that we've undergone, the, now that we have undergone um, training the learning agenda at least we have to experiment we have to apply um, these things inside the classroom and reflect how do I um, using Borton's model right how do I improve 
if I will deploy game-based learning again in the future? What are the points for improvement? What are the things that I have to retain? Um, so reflection is very key. Um, I suggest if you will reflect, um, the simplest uh, model that we can use is the uh, Borton model revised by Rolf, the what, so what, and now what model. Very, very, very simple but very impactful if you want to use that for reflection. All of this are anchored on trusting relationships, especially in the time of change. Trust, particularly um, trust of the leadership with the leadership is very important that particular notion of uncertainty can be um or, or feeling rather of uncertainty can be moderated by this particular uh, particular particular aspect trust so it goes back to getting the buy-in of our people getting the buy-in of the academic staff no, so they will have to trust us and trust our vision as we scaffold their transformation. So that's it. My final point is about the transformation of our learners. This is a model that I proposed myself. This is called the 3S model. It's the uh, C step and solve model. Um, this is a model that I have developed specifically for online learning and accounting courses. So, um, the, um, the situation is, um, the content is computational. There are computations. So, the, the question always, whether it's um, learning currently or learning in the future, I think, is how do we make our learners perform the learning outcomes so demonstration i think is still very important inside this classroom um and then we give them some sort of scaffolding activities um as we all know scaffolding is um an activity that will allow the learner to perform the learning outcome still with the help from the facilitator and after that we let go of the learner and let them independently practice um the learning outcome or perform the learning outcome along this ways uh, along this um this process rather is the reflection of the learner for each particular stage after the demonstration process so what should you improve on as a learner during the scaffolding process what are the mistakes that he or she um, has committed or they have committed in the process and for the in the, after the independent practice so how do I improve as I perform this learning outcome? This is my um, my model of transforming the learner. This is, um, as we all know, um, as um, well, based on my reflections, we can only, we will definitely transform the learner inside the classroom, definitely, as we teach. Back in the day, we were taught, we, um, when I look at the model, how we were taught back in the day it's demonstration plus independent practice there's no scaffolding or very little i should say scaffolding and very little reflective practice for our learners to be transformed because as we all know learning learning definitely is about change changing for the better crucial is that we must be able to carefully design the learning process. This is true whether learning currently or learning in the future, learning with the current situation or learning in a hybrid um, hybrid environment, scaffolding, especially for higher order thinking skills, scaffolding is a very important process that we must not be able to, uh, that we must be able to factor in our um, learning design. My point, I guess, when I talk about the transformation of learners, whether it's in the future or currently, is that transformation of the learner is an intentional, scientific, and artistic process, as we all know. We cannot leave to chance the transformation of our learners. We have to carefully plan, carefully plan the, um, the learning encounter. Um, due to the limitation of time, I cannot explain the model in full detail, but that is the very general, um, very general concept about it. This is called the 3S model, the C step and solve model. If there's one thing that we can learn from this model, 
other than the mechanics of the model is that learner transformation is something intentional. Learner transformation is not something that we leave to chance. And learning learner transformation is anchored on a vision. And in our case, our micro vision inside the classroom is the learning outcome, the ability of the learner to perform the outcome. Now we go to the end of our uh, discussion. So we were able to look at transformation in different levels, organizational, academic staff, and the learner level at that. We also have discussed the possible models to understand how transformation will happen in these particular levels and the reckoning values. For the organization, it's organizational fit. For the academic staff, it's the ideal self. How do we view ourselves as teachers in the future as we go into hybrid futuristic approaches? And for the learner, the ability of the learner to perform the learning outcome. So what is the message behind here? You know, we've been hearing um, we are living in the VUCA or the VUCAD world at that. But look at the first aspect of the world right now, volatility. It is evident in our discussion that that volatility can be answered by another V, and that is vision. In an organizational level, our vision must be fit with our environment, with our strategy. For the academic staff, the academic staff, the academic staff's vision of hi of himself, herself, and themselves is very important for them to transform. And for our learners, the micro vision of the learning outcome is very important for them to transform. And this micro vision, the learning outcome, is our anchor as teachers for us to slowly scaffold their transformation. Friends and colleagues, at the end of the day, I would like to propose this conjecture. Whether it's in the past, in the present, or in the future, vision is the reckoning value for us to transform our organizations our people, and at the end of the day, our learners. A pleasant morning to everyone and congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Yabut. Uh, we will remember your C-Step-Solve model. It was really worth listening to the bright ideas of our guest speakers who explored the theme of the LCUP JERA International Web Conference titled Transformation in Higher Education with Hybrid Perspective, a Futuristic Approach. Now, uh, we remind those who are um, presenting, do not worry because you will all have your uh, sufficient time to finish your uh, presentation. Your 20 minutes will still be 20 minutes. We will just have some flexibility. Remember, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the guest speakers were talking about flexibilities and this is one adjustment on time because there are things we cannot control, particularly uh, connect internet connectivity. We believe that the hybrid perspective explored by the guest speakers of this international conference is agreeably a futuristic approach to transforming higher education. Learning these approaches adapt us to the necessary flexibilities, one of which is time flexibility, in preventing us to be what Dr. Waker called yesterday's, yesterday as robopressors or roboctorer and our learners, robo-learners. Thumbs up to our guest speakers. At this juncture, the felicitation of guests will be delivered by the beloved Vice President for Spiritual and Religious Formation and Extension, Sister Mary, Mary Shiba O Principe OSA, who will be represented by the Community Extension Office Director, Angelo Juan, from uh, the La Consolacion University, Philippines. Director Juan. Do we have Director Juan here? Yeah. 
Well, uh, you see, this can happen in uh, live streaming. So uh, while we are waiting for um, Director Juan, uh, I have to um, make some um, slight change in the evaluation form. The evaluation form, as I earlier announced, uh, supposedly was at the plenary, but um, it was decided by the committee that uh, the evaluation form will be accessed at the parallel sessions that you will attend. Uh, the uh, evaluation or the certificates of those who attended yesterday will be um um, simultaneously um, uh, was this um, distributed through the parallel sessions. So uh, we just need to wait for that time. And those who attended, you can enter any of the parallel sessions of your choice. I'm sure you will learn a lot from it. So or uh, the topics are really wonderful, considering that we are uh, really drastically changing uh, towards the um, transformational education because we had been caught by surprise by the uh, uh, drastic change in the paradigm, uh, educational paradigms. Now, do we have uh, Director Angelo Juan, please? For the felicitation of guests. Educational paradigms. Right, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Director Angelo One, please, for the felicitation of guests. Educational paradigms. Uh, Dr. Rowan, I don't know. Uh, probably you're using different gadgets, so it's giving us, you know, some echoes. Uh, uh, we are getting repetitious delivery of the lines that, ad has, that I had mentioned earlier. So uh, we are waiting for your delivery, Director Rowan. Different gadgets, so it's giving us, you know, some echoes. Uh, we are getting repetitious delivery of the license that I have mentioned earlier. So uh, we are waiting for your delivery. Director. Okay. Can you hear me now, Mom? We can. And we can see your slide as well, sir. Our dearest sister Mary Sheba, O Principe, OSA. The Vice President for Religious Formation and Extension has given me a privilege to express her kindest wishes to everyone in this web conference. To the highly esteemed President Chairman of Globus Education Research Association, Dr. Kunit Kumar Agarwal. The well-respected president of La Consolacion University Philippines, Sister Edita S. Serna, OSA PhD. To our distinguished keynote speakers and all the attendees to this International Research Conference, a grace-filled day. Dr. Rivera once said, education is a good. It is to say that education is the good that people throughout the world cannot afford not to have. And we realize that COVID-19 pandemic had made schools, colleges, universities reduced to mere structures. Yet, new approaches have been considered and breed new ways to deliver education at its fullest sense of good. Schooling, as it is hardly moving beyond the line of the COVID-19 pandemic, proving itself a worthy institution in providing the people all over the world the conditional access via virtual connectivity, though least and predictable and worse internet technology in other countries. Today, our distinguished sages indeed graced our day 
with wonderful and inspiring knowledge. They uncovered and exposed the layers of the hardened walls and gave us peaceful hope to soar new heights and see unimagined possibilities. My colleagues, allow me to express and extend our wish-filled gratitude to our distinguished speakers for being with us and in making this international research conference an emp empowering experience. Let me do the honor to award to them the Certificate of Appreciation. Citation reads, Globus Education and Research Association and La Consolacion University, Philippines. In joint collaboration, organizing an international web conference. This certificate of appreciation is awarded for imparting their valuable insights and inspiration to the students, researchers, and academicians during the International Web Conference on Transformation in Higher Education with Hybrid Perspective, a Futuristic Approach, this July 24, 2021. Signed, Dr. Punit Kumar Agarwal, President and Chairman of Globus Education and Research Association, India. And Sister Edita Ezrina, OSA, PhD, President, La Consolacion University, Philippines. Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Dr. Gagan Kort Kreja. Dr. Kel Prakash Jayan. Dr. Vijay Pratap Tiwari. Dr. Judith J. Sugai. Ms. Anatum Altier. Dr. Deepak L. Waikar. Dr. Priyanka Rani. Dr. Bauna Yadav. Mr. Eugene Rowan S. Hu. Ms. Monica Verma Saha. Dr. Nina Bandari. Dr. Maria Cristina E. Zulueta. Professor Maribel R. Gaite. Dr. Gazim Tatli Lioglu. Mr. Fermin Antonio D.R. Yabu. Dr. Ramatu Yusuf. Dr. Jocelyn Hipone. Dr. Enrico F. Rosales. We express our sincerest gratitude to Dr. Punit Kumar Agarwal, President and Chairman, Globus Education and Research Association. To Dr. Sister Edita Ezerna, OSA, President of La Consolacion University, Philippines. To Dr. Nidi Agarwal, 
Conference Director and the Principal of International School of Education in Mantec Institutions, India. To Dr. Maria Evangeline L. Paraay, Conference General Chair, Vice President for Research, Publication, and Linkages, La Consolacion University, Philippines. Once again, thank you so much to our guest speakers and to everyone. As we continue this event, I wish you a wonderful day of dialogue in truth. Dr. Janet, please unmute your microphone. Uh, again, uh, you see, I'm not used to turning on. My, thank you for uh, reminding me every time I missed hitting the mute button. Before announcing the house rules for the parallel session, allow me to recognize the hands and minds behind this LCUP JERA International Research Conference. We deeply appreciate JERA, ably, le ably led by its president, Dr. Nidi Agarwal. The busy hands at the backstage of LCUP are the MPO director, Mr. Ezekiel uh, Rodriguez and his staff, the MIS team headed by Mr. Florante Reyes for their technical expertise, Dr. Maria Cristina Izilueta, who I learned introduced JERA to LCUP, the conference convener, Dr. Jocelyn Bihipona, and not to forget the wonderful ladies in our unit, the Research, Publications, and Linkages Office, Ms. Cassie Raimundo for coordinating the event, Ms. Ronamel Cruz for the paperwork and overall assistance, Ms. Via Galman for documentation and technical assistance. Of course, we value the support from the different offices of LCUP and the wonderful, wonderful moderators and coordinators of the parallel sessions. Thank you so much. Now, back to our dear presenters, whose time is up for their ideas to be made known internationally. Your 20 minutes will start uh, after the house rules. Dear attendees, it is also now your time to experience an informative and productive online virtual international research conference through the next segment of the conference, the parallel sessions which uh, the uh, attendees had, um, had been continuously talking after yesterday. Let me remind you of some house rules on the parallel sessions. Before entering the breakout rooms, make sure that your microphone and video are turned off. You can turn on your microphone when you are recognized to speak. Please turn on your microphone and your video when presenting. Avoid unnecessary noises and disturbances during your presentation or when you are recognized to speak. Speak audibly and clearly but not slowly, okay? We don't want to be robo-fessors or robo -terrors. Listen to the breakout room rules to be discussed by your moderator because there are specific do's and don'ts which your moderators will be explaining to you later on. You will enter the parallel session through Google Meet. At, um, what time is it? It's 1.41 and we are given 30 minutes uh, to, uh, for a break, uh, health break or lunch break. So uh, 1.41, um, 30 minutes after that, that will start the 20 minute each presenter. Okay. So... Um, a minor adjustment that I had uh, already mentioned earlier, instead of uh, evaluation link being shared at the plenary, uh, it will be accessed at the parallel sessions. Now, the uh, certificates will be generated uh, after um, after uh, completing the evaluation form. So those uh, who were able to complete the form yesterday through the evaluation link that was shared yesterday you can still uh you can wait for your generated um certificates 
So we need to go back after the parallel sessions. Uh, your moderator will uh, remind you to go back to the plenary session through stream, uh, StreamYard again. Uh, please be reminded that there will be a different link provided and that will be at 4 45 p.m there will there will be no bump there because uh, on that time uh, even if we bump our time now because uh, it will be 20 minutes 20 minutes so if there would be a bump on our time it will be 30 minutes only not no more no less so uh, then we have to go back to the plenary session because uh, Dr. Nidhi Agarwal will be uh, conducting the awarding ceremony on the best paper category and the best presenter category. Then we shall continue with the report summary of the conference convener and the closing address. Okay, so well, we have to go back to uh, from Google Meet after the parallel session, we have to go back to uh stream yard on another link okay it will be shared to you through our um uh, through our um uh, um by our technical team okay on our um uh, screen we shall have a health break lunch break okay so please enter the breakout room on time rise and shine everybody good luck and this is your time Thank you so much, and um, we transfer you to the Google Meet.
Alam naming nag-aalala ka. Kaya ginagawa namin ang lahat ng aming makakaya. Para safe ka dito sa ospital. Ang bawat pumapasok, kinukuha ang temperature at mga detalye para sa contact tracing. Sinisiguro din na may tamang social distancing ang mga pasyente. Ang hospital at medical staff ay nakasuot ng protective equipment. Tuloy-tuloy ang disinfection sa lahat ng areas ng hospital. wala yung lugar sa mga regular na check-up o procedure. At sinisiguro ang mga equipment at kwarto ay sterilized at malinis. Kaya huwag kang mag-alala, stay pat alaga ka dito. Stay pat alaga kayo dito. Dito sa Local Solution University General Hospital, nakahanda na kaming magbigay serbisyo itong bagong panahon para sa iyo at sa pamilya mo.